All right. Good morning, everybody. What's going on? Happy Wednesday. It's March 16th. Today is the FOMC meeting day. I hope y'all are excited. I definitely am because I'm hoping to get some sort of resolution out of markets today, or at least some more information that gives us a better idea of what may be the outcome for the next several weeks. Generally, when the FOMC meeting comes in, they set the tone for the rest of the month or at least the next one to two months until the next FOMC meeting. As of right now, we've had a very uncertain environment due to the Russia-Ukraine war. Every day is a cycle of new news from finding peace to uh, having more war talks to talking about World War III to uh, all kinds of stuff that's, ha that's happening on a day-to-day -day basis in that region. And it's been really, really tough to trade markets because of that. Not only that, commodities markets have been uh, seeing a pretty crazy rise. I'm sure you guys have seen right? Um, oil itself was spiking all the way to the 120s. Right now, it's right um, under 95. Nickel was actually trading up massively, if y'all remember. Uh, nickel futures were trading in an insane, insane premium. Um, There's just many things happening in the world that gave a big sort of sway and a movement to the markets. And as we bring our attention more uh, to crypto, which is something that our community is far more familiar with, you know, that volatility um, has been very, very active in crypto as well, because crypto is now um, part of the mainstream com uh, conversation. People discuss it as part of their portfolios, something that's exciting that's happening in the world um, and, you know, how we can possibly change the future for the benefit of all of us. OK, so crypto over the last several weeks, as I had discussed, we saw massive, massive volatility from the lows to the highs. We saw a 22 percent move and then back down. We retraced that move in three or four days, down 18 percent. And then once again, we saw a big pop around 14 percent, which was retraced in the next 24 hours around a 10 percent or almost a 12 percent down move. And now once again, over the last two or three days, we've now seen another sharp pop of 11%. And if y'all remember yesterday evening, that pop was quickly sold off with a 7% down move. So volatility has been a very, very big part of uh, BTC um, and, and most of crypto, but specifically BTC because Bitcoin is the asset that defines crypto in the portfolio of bigger high net worth individuals, bigger pensions, bigger institutions. And, crypto, uh, and Bitcoin is the only liquid asset that is 24-7 tradable in the entire world. So when pensions and institutions need to start de-risking, um, it might be crypto first that gets a hit, and specifically BTC. So yes, we wanted institutions to come in. Yes, we wanted more money to pile in, but it's also piled in in a way where they now see Bitcoin as nothing but a higher risk uh, S&P 500 or something like basically a VIX uh, for them. VIX is nothing but a, a measurement of fear and greed um, and volatility in the U.S. equity markets. And a lot of big uh, funds see Bitcoin as just that. OK, but that's going to change, in my opinion, because we all know for those of us who have been in the crypto space, that there are so many products, so many amazing things happening in crypto that you can't just discount and label crypto as only Bitcoin, right? So Bitcoin is just part of the game. Unfortunately, right now, we are basically, um, we're basically trapped within the whims of uh, the up and down movement of Bitcoin. Now, over the last several months, the good thing that's happened with alts is that some alts, especially say Rune, uh, which was able to break out over the last you know, two or three weeks, um, Luna, which was you know, basically ripping up for the last almost one month, these assets show that they are not going to be held down by Bitcoin. However, I think this is a bit premature in thinking, uh, thinking that we can start new bull markets in altcoins when Bitcoin and most of the crypto space is going down. And this is where the caveat comes in. Uh, we still need to respect Bitcoin as, as kind of the king of the crypto market. Uh, and it dictates, actually, almost like a uh, it gives a 
litmus test of understanding of how bullish is the crypto market, how risk on is the crypto market from the standpoint of external investors. And as of right now, I don't think that this chart to me looks like a risk on um, asset. Okay, what this looks to me is Bitcoin is trying to figure it out in this particular area. BTC is trying to figure it out. It's definitely funneling here, and that's good, right? The outcome of contraction usually leads to an expansion to either side. I've talked about this before. I really don't know which side it's going to break. I think every day, every few days, you know, people ask me like, well, what do I think of the market? Should I start going long? And, you know, should they start picking up uh, these spot positions? I don't know, right? The environment that we're in right now, uh, whether it's from the Fed standpoint, more than likely raising interest rates um, to having insanely high inflation here in the US and most parts of Europe to um, Chinese stocks, which have been getting hammered like crazy, I don't know if you all have been paying attention to Chinese stocks, but you know, here's Alibaba, right? Alibaba basically looks like any other, you know, shit coin in the crypto space. And that's not good because Alibaba is basically the Amazon of China. So if something is clearly wrong in China, here's Tencent Holdings, okay? This is how Tencent Holdings uh, looks, okay? This is in Hong Kong. Here's the Hang Seng Index in Hong Kong. That's how that looks right there, all right? Um, KWeb, which is an internet ETF in China. Look how that looks for the last several months. KWeb ETF is actually down right now almost 80%. That is really, really bad. So there are things happening around the world that are far bigger, far bigger than um, what we're used to in crypto. And we need to sort of humble ourselves to recognize that we are still a small kid playing in the playground of grownups, right? Or a small fish um, in a large pond with sharks. And when you start to recognize that these are the puzzle pieces that you know we are sort of um, being placed within in the, in the context of a larger puzzle of the investing world, and we're still small fish, you have to then start to be careful with your risk, be able to recognize that because the market is so uncertain, you have to make sure that you start dialing down your position size and you start, you know, being okay with the bias of uncertainty uh, rather than having a bullish or bearish bias. Because when you stay on the fence, right, you're quickly able to be nimble between the bullish and the bearish thesis. You don't have to marry anything. You just got to be careful in the market. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> Elizabeth says, Ukraine and Russia drop neutrality plans to an end. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that, Elizabeth, because I think I just tweeted that from Walter uh, Bloomberg right here. Ukraine and Russia have made significant progress on a tentative 15 uh, point peace plan and a ceasefire, uh, Russian withdrawal, you know, all this stuff, right? Those of us who have been uh, watching this whole sort of um, uh, pony show for the last several uh, weeks, have realized that this is like um, two countries, and actually it's more than two countries. It's Russia and Ukraine, then there's the NATO countries around them, and then there's the United States. And everybody wants to achieve what they really want to achieve, right? In all honesty, no one really gives a shit about Ukraine. It's just like, hey, come be part of our you know, VIP club. And the other person wants them to be part of their VIP club. And sadly, it's the Ukrainian people who are getting caught in the middle. Now, the point of all this is these guys change their minds literally every single day. But this is good, right? These are good things that can happen, hopefully, as a resolution in that particular area. Because obviously, no one wants a nuclear war. No one wants a war at all, OK? So hopefully, this pans out. Now, if positive news like this pans out, this, in my opinion, could be temporarily good for the markets, especially crypto markets, okay? However, if the talks fizzle out, which they have been for the last several weeks, whenever good news like this comes out, um, once again, we're back in the whole, you know, midst of chop, which makes sense because we haven't really been accomplishing a whole lot for the last several weeks. We've just been going sideways, okay? So in this particular instance, right, if you were to start looking at potential trading opportunities, uh, honestly, there, it's really just a flip of a coin, right? If you believe that in this particular area, we're bottoming out um, because we have, I don't know, some sort of ascending trend line that's being built right here, and we're respecting that trend line, 
that's one reason why you think that um, you know we could be bottoming out. You believe that in this particular area, there's a lot of selling happening, um, and it doesn't look like the sellers are able to break the floor just yet. That's another good reason. Um, you believe that Bitcoin markets and um, the stock market may be heavily bottomed out. The sentiment is really, really high and fearful. That might be another reason for you to think we've bottomed and we might head up further. Okay. Those are the positives, but what are the negatives? Well, the negatives are still clear, right? The Fed doesn't have our back right now, meaning they're not interested in money printing. They're not interested in helping the markets um, by keeping interest rates low or lowering interest rates or anything as such. In fact, they're doing the complete opposite, which is they want to hike up interest rates. They want to reduce their balance sheet. They want to do a QT, which is quantitative tightening. And these are all things that negatively impact markets. And on top of that, then you have the external fears of Russia and Ukraine, uh, inflation and all that, right? And then of course, the market overall trending down, volumes are down. Um, overall, you know, more and more people are actually heading into stable coins. Uh, this was a data point that I think um, Adam Cochran had mentioned, I think just yesterday, where is it? Um, Adam Cochran had mentioned this. I forgot exactly where. Uh, it's somewhere on my Twitter feed. You guys could check it out. But basically, the point is that, you know, when you see more and more people piling into stable coins, that means they're going risk off. Like they're, they're becoming far more careful about the market um, and they're becoming very cautious. And this has been a trend for the last you know, several months. More and more people are actually heading into stable coins because they're seeking you know, safety and security and rather you know, not wanting to face um, the uncertainty. Okay? But the point is that when that uh, stable coin level hits a threshold, okay, let me see where I can find it. I think Bradley had posted about it somewhere. Oh, here it is, right? Um, so here's what Adam Cochran posted. Let me just retweet this so you can find it on my Twitter feed. Okay. So um, Nansen's uh, smart money stablecoin tracker puts stables uh, rate at 9%. Okay. Only time it was higher uh, was last June after the big crash. Not a great outlook and shows that uh, bulls, uh, some bulls are for sure LARPing. Okay. So point is, what he's saying is that in this particular instance, there is still a lot of people piling into stable coins, right? Yet back then in June, if y'all remember back here, we still dropped another, you know, 10, 15% and headed back towards the lows, right? So what does that imply for the current price action? That means that we may have another, you know, couple of weeks of consolidation. We may have another dip down towards these lows in the next few weeks. And once that stablecoin threshold hits a real high, meaning a lot of people have capitulated, even the big bulls, that might be the instance where the market starts to break back up. Okay. So the point is that stable coins are a good gauge of recognizing, you know, how many of the big whales, the big, you know, high net worth individuals are capitulating. And when they do capitulate, then the market more than likely could potentially bottom. All right. And that moment is not yet as per uh, this thread right here, all right? What are my thoughts on the market? I think I've told y'all before, I've been very uncertain. In our 5K challenge account, right? Um, we've just been sitting in cash. We take trades here and there, but it's just so hard to trade uh, the market right now that I've just been kind of sitting tight, waiting for hopefully the FOMC meeting to pass, waiting to see what kind of resolution we get. And this is really what it takes in these conditions, right? Instead of chopping yourself back and forth, back and forth, um, you know, you just got to sit tight, be patient and see if the market could give you um, a better opportunity and give you better clarity. And I'm hoping that we get that today. Okay. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. All right. Now, altcoins wise, yesterday I'd point out that, yeah, you know, it looked like FTM had bottomed. If you're going for a potential longs, Right? You just want to go for the areas of liquidity. Okay? You don't want to start shooting for the skies and say, hey, this is the bottom and we're going to start you know, you know, a new bull trend because there is, first of all, no um, metric to support that we are going to start a new bull trend. Okay? User activity has been going down. Overall volumes have been going down. Um, the, there, there's far more um, hacks and exploits and uh, um, money coming off these farms and these stakes 
uh, the, the staking opportunities uh, that are coming out, right? So all things are kind of pointing to the idea that we're going to be in a prolonged bear market and or we might soon, you know, be close to a capitulation. But I don't see a metric in the market that's telling me we're going to start a new bull cycle. What I do, however, think that there is an opportunity to play is the near term um, capitulation that we may have seen, which is excess fear uh, in the market. If this um, whole, you know, Russia, Ukraine news materializes. Right. So let's just say um, all this stuff, this Russia, Ukraine stuff materializes today. And who knows, we start having more peace talks. And then today the FOMC comes out with just a basic 25 uh, basis point hike. If all these things are positives, then maybe I can say, okay, maybe the next couple of weeks, we may get a relief rally, right? That means BTC could give us a spike back towards 46,000, maybe as high as 51, 52 K. Okay. That's one idea. Um, Ethereum uh, just had its layer zero test which is a big, big positive. I think Ethereum is in the background of most people's attention. Um, let me see here. Ethereum, as you can see right here, layer zero test, broadcast message sent. Um, this is on their test net, by the way, from Ethereum to Avalanche, Polygon, BNB Chain, Phantom, Arbitrum, and Optimism, right? This is a good thing because we know that Ethereum has been trying to have its merge uh, they're trying to stay competitive in the landscape of these new L1 ecosystems, okay? So I think Ethereum is also maybe an asset that might get overlooked in the next coming weeks. So if Ethereum starts to push up, where can it break out to? Well, first, easiest level to identify is right here, local high, okay? That's around 2775. Next big level is right here, around 3000 flat, or maybe as high as, you know, $3,100 way the heck up here. 3100 3200 this little pocket right here okay after that if we can smash up above this level and hold then i'm thinking we're going to get all the way to 4000 until that particular point these are all level to level trades same with btc like i said from this particular point onward if we start breaking up 46.2 and then you know about 51k if we somehow are able to smash above 51 then we can start talking about you know 58 to 60k but I think let's just start, you know, only thinking for 46 and maybe as high as 52 for now. Okay. And guess what? We're only at, you know, 40.7K. There's just, there's not enough momentum right now. There's not enough positive catalyst to start, you know, pushing us uh, higher just yet. All right. So let's be patient in the market, but let's not also buy into, you know, the heavy bear fear that everyone is uh, really talking about. Like I said, stay on the fence. So you can stay nimble, you can stay flexible. So you're able to kind of go back and forth um, and, and position yourself you know, e in an easy way, all right? Um, Solana, I think is another asset that I've been paying attention to. I think we've basically kind of hit a local low right here. If we start pushing up from here, I could see Solana hitting you know, maybe as high as $100, a higher zone around here, around 120s. That could be another you know, potential area that we could pop up to. I don't know what happens after that. Like I said, you know, near term for Solana could be 120s. If it breaks above this, then we could see 170 way the heck up here, all right? Okay, um, I'm not seeing anything in the order books right now. I expect today to be very volatile just because we're headed into the FOMC meeting. Um, we're gonna have, you know, news hit the wire about Russia and Ukraine stuff. So that's going to move markets back and forth, up and down. So I'm not expecting um, a big directional movement out of the market today. Um, let me see here. Nothing really happening on the um, agro trader right here. This is where I expect like, okay, is the market kind of showing us the tape is moving fast in one direction or another? And if it's not, then I don't really care a whole lot, right? When it's just like back and forth, up and down movement like this, it's just a you know bunch of people putting on big size, maybe hedges, maybe a bunch of algos, you know, starting to put on big size, um, and they're trying to gamble on the market. And it doesn't help when you're gambling on the market because you're just going to get squeezed out in either direction, right? So anyway, um, not really seeing anything from that front. Um, let me see here. Trading light. 
I didn't see anything uh, in terms of big support or resistance um, from BTC in terms of walls. Uh, what I do find interesting is, you know, if you kind of look at this open interest right here for um, Bitfinex, kind of just been floating sideways, right? So this doesn't really give us any indication that Bitfinex is, you know, getting positioned for a big move up or a big move down. It's just a whole lot of chop, a whole lot of sideways. And that's okay because, you know, sometimes even big players, right? It doesn't matter how big of a player you are in the market. In context of the market, everybody is still just a player, right? No one can truly dictate um, the entire movement of the market. No one person can. Okay, so the market is always bigger than um, all of us. So the point is that even Bitfinex whales are just kind of confused. They're like, what the hell is going on in this situation? I don't think anyone knows. Um, same thing if we go down here to say FTX or Binance Futures, I'm not quite sure anyone is really convinced of anything. You can kind of see open interest just floating sideways here on Binance Futures. Um, let's see FTX. FTX. FTX kind of grinding up, but you know, still nonetheless, right? Like you're still seeing basically a whole lot of sideways and open interest. And, and when you start seeing sideways and open interest, that's a, a clear indication that you know, the market is just choppy and no one really knows, you know, which direction things are going to break out. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, Michelle is asking, can we take a look at some charts that you think are solid opportunities, weak assets in the event FO FOMC causes downward pressure? Also, what's the latest on FTM? I see um, 125 level feeling like a solid resistance. Yeah, I, I really don't know all, you know, kind of talked about this before. Um, you're going to see a whole lot of, you know, low time frame chop, uh, quick, you know, one day candles that pop up that quickly get rejected. Or you might see, you know, an asset that's been aggressively oversold, keep trending up higher. Um, I'm not quite sure, you know, how many times I got to say this for you guys, but please be careful in these market conditions. You can try to trade it. Um, more than likely, you know, whatever money you make, the market is going to try to claw it back out of you. It's just the probabilities of how it works, right? In these conditions, because it's so much chop, there's just, you know, it's basically like a coin toss literally every single day until you start seeing resolution and clarity um, out of these external factors, you know, whether it's Russia and Ukraine, FOMC meeting, et cetera, et cetera. I can mention, you know, shorting and longing opportunities to you guys, but as I've said before, um, you know, be very, very careful in the market. Um, here's a perfect example, right? So if you're looking for areas where markets could potentially bottom and start pushing up higher, all you got to do is look for next points of liquidity. So above this high around 28 and a half, that's the next point I can see, you know, Adam pushing into. And this is really where you should be getting out of your long trade, okay? That's really it. And if you do get out of your long trade, right? And say the market pushes up higher, well, then the next point of resistance is right here around $30. This is probably a better short trade from here if this thing starts failing back down. You can short the rejection right here, stop above this high, you know, um, trade, trade your short back towards this high volume level, which is around 27, 25 or so. All right, um, AVAC, same thing. You know, we bottomed at this $67 level, uh, almost like a triple bottom, if you will, or you could say this is like, you know, your near term high or low. The reclaim of um, the 67 means that you can place your stop for your long right here, take your long position right into 76.50, uh, okay? And then from there, you can decide, okay, maybe this thing pushes up higher into 80 or 82 dollars and then you can short at this high stop right there and then short this back into 70 dollars or back into uh 67 okay these are all the level to level of trades that i can really find um and as i've said before like i'm really not taking that many trades because i'm not really accomplishing a whole lot right i'm trying to trade back and forth there's just too much chop sometimes i make money sometimes i give back money to the market so i said screw this you know it's not worth the time and the energy uh, in these conditions and even if you are making money in this market right now right 
just count your blessings, take the money. All right, take the money, sit tight. Because if you try to keep trading this market, the, the probabilities are just very, very high that you're just going to give it, give back all your profit that you made in the chop and probably then some. Okay. And I don't mean to sound like, you know, someone who's lecturing, but I'm just letting y'all know that's just how it is. Um, I want to show you all something on Rune uh, because I've been kind of keeping a track on Rune here um, from a level to level perspective. Okay. So we have a couple of things happening in Rune. Uh, first of which was, you know, obviously we had this big sort of first rejection. This was obviously where the bulls kept buying and buying and they were able to send the price upward. And this is by the way, on the back of that fundamental catalyst change for Rune, which is um, Rune is going to be utilized to exchange Bitcoin into UST and use it for staking as well, right? So Rune is the protocol that's been uh, that's going to be used for um, Luna, basically. So that's why I think over the last several weeks, you've seen Rune and Luna move up together uh, step by step. All right. So that's, in my opinion, a good thing. Now, near term, what you could say is in this particular area, right, you can go here, check out this tool called the fixed range volume profile. And I like to use this tool in little consolidations because I like to look at the pockets and say, where are the areas of consolidations in this red line, which is the point of control? Where is that point of control? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a couple of points of controls um, and tr try to find out where exactly in these particular consolidations do we find um, you know, areas of high confluence, areas of high volume. So I see four important levels on the way up where we've had a decent amount of consolidation. Why are these levels important? Okay, so let me zoom in a little bit. Hopefully everybody can see, right? So we know that Rune has been kicking ass for the last you know, uh, week or two, right? It's just been ripping up. I think it's basically gone up 100 or 120% over the last two or three weeks. Now the question is near term, has Rune hit a local top? We don't know, right? If I look at the Rune chart on a daily basis here, okay, I can say, you know what? Yeah, this kind of looks like a near term top to me. You see basically a high volume movement. Okay, let me let me give you all the perfect signs of recognizing a potential top. Okay. Remember, um, there are only clues that you get to understand if things are a top or a bottom. You won't understand if they are definite top or bottom until you see confirmation and continuation to you know the uh, downside or the upside, you know, whatever direction you're looking for. So in this particular instance, what I see is, you know, volume declining, right? Buy side volume declining. And from this particular area, prices went up. So that's the first sign of, okay, market could be, you know, near term topping. Number two, right? We broke up above 640, good sign. We put in a high volume candle move, but then after that, we see a pretty hard, hard rejection right here as a sort of gravestone doji candle. Now you're seeing another daily candle confirm that this is a hard gravestone doji rejection. So these three candles together give you a potential topping pattern. Now, if this is a top, now we start dialing into, all right, what do we do if it is a top? Okay, now we must get into the hourly time frame. On the hourly time frame, all right, we have a few levels below us, we have a few levels above us. We know that this was a high concentration volume consolidation right here before we popped up, right? We popped up, put in a good amount of volume up here. However, we collapsed back down inside the range high right here. So this is your swing failure or your bearish SFP or your um, excess deviation, whatever you want to call it. That means that in this particular instance, if you want to go short here, your stop has to be at minimum right there or right there at least. You can have it above range high as well, but that's a little tight because you might get wicked right here and then price could, uh, prices could come back down. But if this is a confirmed top, there's no single reason why price should have had it back here or back here, okay? So we're talking now of the um, short opportunities, right? So you go short right here, 
stop above local high right there or this high right there. Okay, that's opportunity number one. Number two is prices reclaim this area, try to push up, fail somewhere around here. You can add to your short right here. And once prices collapse back down, you bring your stop down from here down to here and then ride this trade back down to 675, which is the previous high right there. And then point of control, which is this red line right here around $6 and 40 cents. Okay, those are the shorting opportunities. Longing opportunities, you could say, hey, this was the last big consolidation period that helped propel us all the way here. What should price do in this particular instance? Price should come back down to at least range high, right? That is a potential bottom right there or down to the point of control. That's a, pot a potential bottom right there. So you can long right here or you can long right here. And then you take this trade back to right here, which is the range low of this particular area, or you take it to the range high of this particular area. Those are your long opportunities. Is that pretty clear? So you can see directionally, there's you know a trade to take on both sides, all right? We just don't know if the market is ready to start breaking down. I think the market will give you a confirmation that is starting to break down when this level right here gets broken through, okay? When price starts to you know start breaking below like this, like this, then that's more than likely the top. You can have a higher conviction that you know you can probably go short and then take this trade back down. Not investment advice, but you know that's that's how I would be looking at it. Okay. So there's you know kind of your longing and shorting opportunities. Um, I think there's a question about FTM. I really don't know what's happening with FTM. There's just you know too much negative news. The developers leaving and all that. Yeah, maybe you know it could squeeze up a little bit higher around 125, 126. Um, who knows? Maybe there's like a long opportunity to be taken from here. Stop just below local low. Target profit around 127. Okay, you're kind of risking five percent for a gain of 5.8 percent. Not great risk reward, but if you have a high conviction that you're going to push into this high, then that's a pretty good trade. Okay. On a daily basis, I'm still thinking that this is, you know, just a temporary turnaround in FTM. Yeah, maybe it clears, you know, some local highs right there, and then it starts collapsing back down. That's, you know, one way to look at it for sure. All right. I think the next highest level of support is 95 cents to a dollar. So keep that in mind, you know, if you are thinking about shorting um, on the way back down, that's probably a decent, you know, short trade target. Right. Cool. Um, it looks like the uh, neutrality proposal was rejected. I mean, not really surprised, right? Uh, the point is that you know you're going to see a lot of back and forth like this. I mean, two countries are literally uh, going to war. Um, they're trying to one is trying to take over the other. It's not going to be an easy resolution by any means. So, anyway. Um, Let's be cautious in the market, all right? Any other questions? Anything else I can cover? <clears throat> all right. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining. Y'all take care. Um, good luck, and I will keep you updated through the day. Remember, today, after the New York session close, we're going to have Fassel and Austin join the live session call uh, for Advantage members. Uh, they're going to be talking about things that they're seeing in the stock market, what they're positioning themselves in, um, and what their thoughts are, you know, on the, the macro picture, the economy, bond markets, et cetera. All right. I look forward to that session. It'll be after the New York session closed today. All right. Cheers, everybody. Take care.